if you are a lover of history, specifically like early to mid medieval times, what they call the dark ages, look, this, there's nothing dark about this. You're going to enjoy this book. My next author, her name is Alex Forrester, and she wrote The Saxon Princess and the King of Scots. Welcome. Hi, Sam. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Uh, this book is so much fun. Let's, let's just talk about, first of all, the general message, if there is a general message in your book. Well, I don't always think of a book as having a message. I love to read mostly for entertainment's sake. And so for me, I think I'd love it if my readers would be entertained and enjoy the novel. If they get a message out of it, so much the better. Uh, but because it is historical fiction, one of the things I really hope is that I'll be able to share some true historical knowledge. I did do research on this novel and I tried to include as much of historical fact as I could. And so I hope that people will be able to get a sense of what happened in history, how different people lived in different time. Um, and then obviously with my take on it, on what would be the thoughts, feelings, motivations behind the characters, which is something that's you know, open to interpretation. So you're kind of filling in those gaps of history that this is your thoughts of what could have happened. Yeah, exactly. You have the bare facts of history in the you know historical um, research books, um, but they don't really tell you how people were feeling, what their personalities were. Right. Sometimes they do, but mostly it's something left to the imagination. And so this would be my imagination of how Margaret and Malcolm's lives were and how their relationship developed. All right, set the stage for us. Give us the theater of the mind. Where are we and what are we starting to uh, see around us with, in that way? So I actually got inspired to write this novel when I went on a trip to Scotland. And Scotland is such a beautiful country. Um, and it really speaks to me because I think I'm a bit of an introvert. I like, you know, peacefulness and being out in nature. And in Scotland, there's so much gorgeous nature and it's very it has a sense of grandeur you have these large open spaces and you know large mountains and beautiful sparkling lakes which they call lochs um you, i still have these images of either you know bright green grass with the perfect little circle of a blue lake in the middle mm -hmm. or sometimes everything is covered in mist and it's mysterious um, and it's just a beautiful place and so as i was traveling there I came to a lovely medieval castle. I mean, it's been built since, built up since then, but the very core of Edinburgh Castle has a medieval little um, church, a little chapel. And in it, there is a beautiful stained glass window. Um, and it's of a woman who's very you know, beautiful and she's noble and she's holding a book, so she seems educated. And she has this gorgeous flowing blue gown and blue's my favorite color. So I don't know, that just, that stained glass really spoke to me. She wow. seemed so beautiful and I could see myself in her sort of, she seemed kind of how I'd like to be imagined. You know, this beautiful queen with a book and a flowing blue gown. So I was a little intrigued by that. And I went outside and I found a plaque and it turned out that she was St. Margaret and she had been queen of Scotland in medieval times. And she was married to King Malcolm, the king mm -hmm. of Scotland, who was actually a very warlike king and he fought a lot of battles. But she was a saint. She was known for her education, her piety, her gentle nature, and just the thought that they managed to have a loving, happy relationship, it seems. Um, and yet we're so different. And it's something that really intrigued me. And so I started doing research on that. And that's the tale I'm trying to tell in this novel. Hmm. There's a lot we can take into the modern times with this opposites attracting um, and actually respecting difference of opinions and, and staying married. I mean, this is... As a modern story, this is sounds that sounds like the fairy tale to me. <laughs> what are your thoughts about these opposites attracting and and what do you think that it brought to the the land that they served? Yeah, so as I was doing the research, I did come across something of an explanation that in medieval world, the gender roles were very distinct. Um, and I don't know if that's a good thing. It certainly doesn't resonate with me. But in those times, it was very clear that the man's role was to defend and grow his power and to defend his people and the people he loved and his homeland. And to do that, you had to be, to a certain extent, bloodthirsty and violent and aggressive. Um, if people didn't fear you, they would attack. So it would be good to have this image of a strong, powerful king who would ruthlessly defeat all enemies that would come, come at you. So that kind of explains why maybe Margaret wasn't horrified by some of the bloody deeds that Malcolm did. 
Uh, and then the woman's gender role was, you know, you, you had to be, especially if you were a noble, uh, noble woman, you had to be pious. You had to be sweet and kind and meek and gentle. Um, and that's not necessarily who I am. And I don't think that was necessarily who Margaret was uh, in her, you know, in her personality. But it's the role that society kind of forced on her. I think she took it to, you know, make the best that she could out of it. Because despite being, you know, for all intents and purposes, you know, the pious, obedient wife that she was supposed to be, she was also a very powerful queen. And she definitely put her own personal touch on the on ruling Scotland. And unlike a lot of queens, and especially women, but even queens in those days, they hardly ever make it into the historical record. So um, Malcolm actually was married before he married Margaret. He had another wife. We know nothing about her. She just passed out of history with just her name mentioned. Hmm. But Margaret, she made an impact and she really put a lot of the, you know, the religious and political systems that they were developing, she was the impetus behind it. And she is remembered now and has a legacy. So I find it's really interesting that she managed to work within the confines of the gender role and yet at the same time do something with her ambitions. Mm. How did you fill in the gaps outside of facts? Imagination, um, drawing on maybe some of my own personal feelings as well. So one of the things I discovered as I was doing the research was that when Margaret was very young, to us it would seem you know, extremely young, she was just a little child really, um, but there was a discussion of having her marry the King of Scotland, the new King of Scotland at that time, Malcolm. Uh, but that, that fell through. And there's not much explanation about why it fell through. I would assume it would have been something around dowry. You know, those were the real considerations about marriage back then. Right. But I also felt, because he was in the same court in England as she was, and I felt that they probably met. And I imagined myself as a young teenager meeting a handsome young king who might be my husband one day. I could see myself becoming smitten instantly. Um, and yet he obviously didn't return those feelings. Right. And maybe because the dowry wasn't there for some other reason, hmm. rejected her. And I imagined how that would feel. And so that's kind of how I wrote that. Um, and then in vindication of my you know, overlooked teenage self, eventually when he meets her as a young woman who's grown into her intelligence and her looks and is now a force to be reckoned with, then he wants her. I and then love he wants it. Her, even without a dowry, because at that point her um, brother has been exiled Okay. And she's, you know, the sister of an exiled prince who has nothing. And still he wants her for herself now. So I found that really interesting. And that's kind of like trying to look at the facts of history and then put the feeling of how I would have lived through that. You love history. I do. It just exudes from you. I mean, I do. where, where did this love come from? Um, well, I don't know. I've always enjoyed reading. And historical fiction is one of the genres I like most. I've always been fascinated by how different people live. And I think maybe it's because seeing how different people live in different times shows you what is always true about people, the eternal truth, um, and being able to kind of have an insight about what is still true to this day, even though the world around us has changed so much. You know, one of the things about medieval times, they kind of talk about the dark ages, yet from what you're saying, they were very educated. There was a lot of beauty. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Well, so I find it interesting. It's again, I guess the dichotomy, I guess people were more specialized in their roles back then. So Malcolm would have been completely illiterate because the king didn't need to know how to write. Wow. He had people who could write and read for him. He needed to know how to fight and how to kill people. Okay. Um, but his wife, if she was an educated noble woman, not all noble women were very educated, but some were. And apparently, actually, in England, the Saxons had a history of making sure their noble women were educated. So they would be able to read and write and do beautiful embroidery. And they had a lot of that, like the culture. I think mm -hmm. they maybe brought a softening touch to their kings. I can't stop thinking about what a, a beautiful compliment they were to each other. I mean, when we relate this to our own lives, um, there's a beauty to opposites attracting. There is, yeah. And I think I think they probably accomplished more because they were you know, both different but strong personalities and were able to work together to accomplish the things they wanted to. Hmm. 
So your next travels, are they going to take you to another country that might inspire a book? Is that what, what you're hoping or well, what are your thoughts? Maybe. But actually, I mean, this trip to Scotland happened ages and ages ago. It's okay. a more recent trip. Um, it took me a while to really take the idea of writing a book seriously because it felt like an unattainable goal, you know, a dream. Um, but my husband kind of has a lot more faith in me than I have in myself, and he pushed mm -hmm. me to it. Uh, so, yeah, I wrote this novel, you know, a, a while ago, but um, there's still a second novel coming. So there's a sequel. Uh, the story's not done yet. So that's what I'm working on now. That's exciting. As a new author, briefly share, if there's someone who's watching or listening and they've got a story in them and they're afraid and they don't have that spouse to give them that encouragement, <laughs> what would you say to them? I think that if it's a good story, it deserves to be heard. It deserves a chance to get out into the world and find an audience and shine. Hmm. And so you should do what you can to give this story its freedom. The world deserves to hear it, right? Yeah. Yeah. Alex Forrester, The Saxon Princess and the King of Scots. Your book is available. Tell us where. It is available on Amazon, Barnes & Noble. It's also available on the website Writers Republic, um, mm -hmm. writersrepublic.com, uh, who was helping me publish the novel. Very good, Alex. It was a joy to talk to you. I hope that your your book just flies off the shelves and and out of uh, out of Amazon and all the places it's available. Writers Republic, such. Thanks awesome. for joining us. Thank you.